Hey, thank you for joining us, everybody. Please uh, hold while we let more people into the, the Zoom meeting. Um, Sean is currently doing that. Uh, as we are doing the event here, please uh, keep your, um, your screen muted. That would be wonderful. We should be starting here in about 30 seconds. Everybody joins us. All right, terrific. Well, let's get started. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jeff Jeffries. I'm the Director of Employer Relations with the CPDC at Carnegie Mellon University. Today we are featuring the Entertainment Technology Center, ETC, which is a joint venture between the School of Computer Science and the College of Fine Arts. Um, we have a few of their leaders today from the program to give you some information on the ETC program. And then at the end of their presentation, we're gonna do some Q &A, um, and A, answer some questions from everybody. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat feature um, and we will get to those questions as we, as we move along. But I would like to introduce you to Dr. Drew Davidson and Susan Timko from the Entertainment Technology Center here at Carnegie Mellon University. Drew, why don't you go from here? I think you're on mute, Drew. How's that? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Uh, and thanks to Sean and everybody there at uh, uh, Main Campus and Employer Relations for inviting us to come. And thanks to everybody who joins us today for this little uh, overview of the Entertainment Technology Center. So like uh, Jeff said, I am uh, the director of the ETC and I'm joined by Susan Timko, who's the director of career services for the ETC. And we're going to go over a little overview of what the program's all about since it's fairly unique not only at Carnegie Mellon but pretty much unique period um, around the world and uh, give you a sense of the range of uh, opportunities that our students have found moving forward and we think it'll be really um, uh, helpful for you all to understand what you could get out of uh, ETC graduates. So I'm gonna dive right into this little presentation with you all. So quick little bit of history as uh, it was founded in 1998 so over 20 years ago um, by Randy Pausch out of the Com School of Computer Science. And for those of you who haven't seen the last lecture, I highly recommend Googling uh, Randy Pausch last lecture. CMU has it posted up on YouTube. It's well worth an hour of your time. And it was, he, his co-founder was Don Marinelli out of uh, the College of Fine Arts and Drama. So this was started by, it was sort of inspired by Randy doing a sabbatical at Disney Imagineering where they were just throwing disciplines together to make these crazy, amazing things. And he came back and they started dreaming of how could we do this uh, in an educational realm. And they decided to do a master's of entertainment technology. Um, this allowed us to be uh, sort of interdisciplinary independent so that we can pull in programmers and technical, technical people out of engineering backgrounds. We could also pull in artistic people, whether it's 2D, 3D, visual effects, graphic design. And then we get people from all over, you know, music, creative writing, business, theater, you name it, we pull those all together. And as it says here in the slide, one of our, um, the focus for the program is it's great to think about how our students move through here to be leaders in terms of creative collaboration and doing innovative, innovative, innovative work and pushing the field forward from here as they go out into the industries. Okay, so we actually, like I said, reward MET. Um, it's a master's in entertainment technology. Um, curricularly, they go through a first semester together that's really, really intense. They do this class called Building Virtual Worlds that Randy pioneered. It is a, a rapid prototyping class where the, they get put on teams of five and they have two weeks to make something go and then shuffle new teams, two weeks go, shuffle, go, shuffle, go. So crazy timelines, working with people we've never worked with before, you know, trying to figure out uh, technology, but really it's all about problem solving together very quickly. At the same time, they all take improvisational acting together. This isn't to make them better comedians or better actors or actresses, but more to think about how to share, sharing credit, sharing ideas, that sort of yes and philosophy that we hope, you know, moves forward with them beyond just the improv class and into their creative work collaboratively so that they really serve the story as they work on their projects together. And then everybody goes through improv, uh, sorry, everybody goes through visual story as well. It's sort of like a filmmaking class for non-filmmakers. 
where we really, again, sort of really focus on how storytelling is a way that a lot of us get engaged. And that's how we, and so we try to help them understand how they can use audio and visuals to help um, create these stories that help us get engaged in whatever you're trying to make, whatever you're trying to experience. And last but not least, I teach a class with fundamentals that Susan helps a lot with because it has these two threads around helping them understand why they're here and what careers they could have going forward. And it has these like two threads of creative development and professional development through that class to help them think about their career trajectories. Uh, and then after that first semester, which is huge in terms of workload and time, they go into the final three semesters, just a two year degree, where they do a semester long project and an elective. Um, projects are, for those of you who know Carney Mill, they're like 36 units, that's a lot. We're expecting about 40 hours a week of um, work out of them. And it's really sort of real world project based learning um, in that they would get put on teams by the faculty and projects can be driven in three ways by clients, external clients, sponsor projects to do some R&D or um, experimental exploration around some topics it can be driven by faculty research or uh, students can pitch their own ideas so like a green light process. And so those projects really set them up to do hands on um, real work experience with all the support of a curricular context within there. Um, and like it says on this slide, you know, that that balance is so important. We have to make sure we have students who have some tech backgrounds so they can work with people with art backgrounds and then have somebody who's interested in management. We can put them all together and they have to collaborate creatively throughout these projects. And it is a two year degree. It's a terminal degree. Um, it's also uh, something, one of the reasons why Randy and Don wanted to do a master's degree primarily is because that allows us to have people come to us with some skill sets already. We're not really focused around what they might call hard skills or some people call perishable skills. Um, we're more focused on the more durable skills, the soft skills of the interpersonal relationships and the innovative work you do together. So the MET is very unique. Nobody else in the world rewards one. Um, it is not an MBA or a master's of science. It helps, it's no, nor is it an MFA. It is um, primarily focused on professional development towards the creative industry. So if you're interested in the business and the finance, you maybe want to go get an MBA. And if you're really interested in doing the technical work on your own, that's probably a master's of science or maybe a PhD. Or if you just want to work on your portfolio um, by yourself, that might be an MFA. If you just like writing papers, that might be an MA. Um, as it says here, like we're very project-based. You're gonna do stuff together and it's all about leadership and innovation. That's where our focus really is. So what happens when they get out of here? What do you get when an ETC student or grad gets out? Somebody who's very, very experienced with uh, tackling cutting edge technology. We don't teach tools. We're much more interested in teaching how people think and problem solve so they can figure things out. Uh, one of the things that uh, people are projecting, the current crop of students are probably going to have 50 to 60 year careers based on like life expectancy and cost of living. Um, and across that 50 to 60 years, they're going to have to do something that's never been invented yet. <laughs> and so we want our students to be comfortable and have lifelong learning skills so that they can really work with um, the latest technologies across their careers and basically get very comfortable tackling something they've never done before. So we hear again and again from our recruiters that our students have a great ability to just join teams and hit the ground running. Um, they're able to contribute almost instantly when they join on, on to teams. Um, because of our focus around sort of like that leadership and innovation, we really are focused on collaboration. So they develop these communication skills so they can talk to programmers or they can talk to artists or they can talk to clients or they can talk to the suits in the in the company. Um, so it's a very sort of nimble, flexible skill set that they get comfortable like rapid prototyping towards the iterative solutions that they need to figure out. Anytime you're doing something like a game or you know, trying to do something creative, I always like to say, if you know exactly what you're doing and how you're going to do it, you're not doing anything creative. So if you start branching into the unknown and trying to explore something you've never done before, that requires iteration and requires doing research. Um, Another thing that they get a lot out of this, like Randy said in the last lecture, we try to give them 10 years worth of feedback in two. So they receive a lot of constructive feedback and we coach and encourage them to give it to each other peer to peer as well. So they develop like a peer support system. And hopefully that again, translates forward into their careers. Um, and they become so experienced in working within constraints and having to think about deliverables and make, meeting those milestones. So they get very comfortable tackling things they've never done before. Um, and they sort of, like I said, they hit the ground running. They're very eager to jump in and get, get going. And so how do we teach this? Um, like I said earlier, it is project-based. 
um, these semester long projects, you know, it's 15 weeks, you know, they're roughly 36, you know, like a full job. That's what we're expecting out of them. They're interdisciplinary in nature as we put the programmers and the artists and designers and the musicians and the business managers together. Um, we work really closely to try to find some corporate connections, either, you know, both in terms of for profit and nonprofit groups that might have interesting design challenges for our students. Um, we also work really hard with faculty to continually have research ideas so that we're pushing out into new spaces. And some of the most exciting projects are when students pitch to us and like we do a real industry driven green light process there. Um, and then the students just take over once the semester goes. They have a lot of support, but we kind of treat it like a little miniature startup where they're engaged directly with their clients. And they have all of our support as they sort of work through these problem solvings. They're academically, they're required to have a playable proof of concept by the end of the semester. You know, it is school, so they could theoretically fail, but it's nice to have this sort of support network within here as we challenge them to really push into new dire um, directions. And these teams, we work really hard to balance throughout the semester so that they, at least we're setting them up to have the skill sets involved to complement each other as they work together. Um, and uh, throughout the semester, like we at quarters and halves and finals, give them all kinds of feedback to help. Like I said, we try to drown them in feedback so that they had sort of like learn how to respond and build on that and listen and iterate appropriately. So I'm gonna turn it over to Susan here and she can give you a sense of after students go through all of this, what happens when they go out into some of them, you know, they definitely get out into like the game industry, the theme park industry, the animation, but we also have some students to get into some new and exciting fields as well. And she can give you an overview of that. Thanks, Drew. Hi, everyone. Yeah, that's what I'd like to do at this moment is just kind of talk about some of these alumni who have taken these skill sets and taken them and using them in a, a, a less traditional path. So this first student, Meg, he is with um, Fidelity Center for Applied Technologies. It's a Fidelity Investment. Um, and you can see here, we, we asked all of the students or the alumni, you know, what they're working on. And you'll see some of the same words that, that Drew has already been talking about, proof of concepts. He's using AR and VR, machine learning. Um, these are things that he was working on at the ETC. And um, he, below the, the second part that we asked him to mention is what they learned at the ETC that really helps them in this current job. Um, and you can see that he mentioned the, the Building Virtual Worlds course, because again, that is such a um, rapid prototyping type of course where you have to iterate and find solutions. And being an, a Center for Applied Technologies, I'm sure he is doing a lot of that, um, that same type of work for Fidelity Investment. Next, Drew, please. Thank you. Um, so Jue is a designer at Apple and we've had a very nice relationship with Apple um, in the recent years. She is a new graduate and she conducts user research, defines um, design objectives and opportunities. And we have also seen this role of UX or UI designer dramatically increase in interest with the students and um, being hired by employers across the board. Again, not just game and themed entertainment and feature animation, um, we're seeing it in software, um, design companies, all of that are, are really seeking out these skill sets. So we are very excited to have students that are very well prepared to go into those kinds of roles. Um, and she mentions that at the ETC, she worked with collaboration, the multi multidisciplinary teams, um, the deadlines, the constraints, all of that have helped her at Apple. Next. Lastly is Matt Costa. He's creative director of marketing at Riot Games. And um, you can see he graduated in 2012. So he's been in the industry a little longer and he has moved up through the ranks uh, at Riot Games. He actually started um, doing video content for them and is now the creative director in marketing. So these students, even though, or these alumni, even though they may be in a tr traditional game company, they do have roles um, that are beyond just game creation. Uh, so he is in marketing and we do see marketing as another great opportunity for our students. There's lots of creative marketing that's going on um, where they're using, making physical things to market uh, and our students fit right in with that. Next, please. All right, so just wanted to give you a list of some organizations um, and some roles, just to get to illustrate 
the different ways that this degree can be used. So we have Amazon, um, uh, Facebook, you know, there are software engineering roles. Um, we have very good software engineers, programmers. Um, then you'll see IDEO, uh, McAfee, they are using UX designers. Um, there's Microsoft Main, uh, Mindcraft with game. Niantic is a technical artist. Um, and then notice with Pixar um, and Blue Sky, which are both feature animation studios, they're used in a production role. Um, so in our industry, that term producer production really equates a lot to project manager. There's very similar skill sets between that. It's just a different kind of job title. So that's just something else to think about um, project management um, that our students can contribute to. Next, please. This is just a big summary of kind of the, the big buckets of roles in um, industries that we, we, we see our students going into. We've already talked quite about quite a few of them. Again, that programmer, software engineer, UX or UI designer, then game design, audio, we always have wonderful audio um, designers coming through the ETC, our artists, producers, and product manager. And that's something new also I've seen in the last couple of years where mostly it's uh, mobile game companies. They need a subject matter expert in game, but then they also need somebody that wants mm -hmm. to spearhead the, the project and use the analytics. And we do have students that come to the ETC with finance, and business backgrounds. Um, Drew had talked earlier about how we balance the incoming classes and with 40% artist, 40% technical, and that other 20, we just put varied, but they could be business, uh, statistics, hard scientists, um, film, all over the place. And I tell everybody that I talked to, my favorite combination was the accountant who was also a master puppeteer and he actually works in R&D. Um, for Disney Imagineering. So they do come with these skill sets that they build on. And that's why that product manager role, I think is becoming more popular um, because they, they have that combination of skill sets. And then just some of the, the major buckets of industry, you know, we've talked about technology, certainly virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, our students get a lot of experience in that with all of the different technologies Drew had mentioned that you know we don't teach tools we teach these other skill sets but the students have the ability to learn different tools while they're there whether it adds to their project or through their coursework I mean building virtual worlds the V stands for virtual so they are getting a lot of that AR and VR experience. Um, we've talked about feature animation Themed entertainment, that's just our buzz for the Disney's and the Universal's of the world um, game. Education, um, and then advertising as we had talked about earlier. Next, please. So something that we wanted to kind of be start thinking about, um, I think we're all probably starting to think about this, is what is work gonna be like when, um, you know, post COVID? Um, and, you know, every day we feel a little more hopeful that there'll be a, a, a vaccine soon. So start to think about these things. And there are skill sets that our students possess that really will lend themselves so well. Um, they are very talented at looking at problems more as opportunities and ways to use creativity to solve problems. They, I don't want to say they think out of the box because that's a really trite way, but they do look at problems differently um, because of all of these different disciplines and skill sets that they possess and all of the work that they've done in teams. They're really talented at that. <clears throat> um, they like to combine technology with story to focus on the user's or customer's experience. And here in the virtual world, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a bigger component of our work is going to be in a virtual space. And these students have gotten very good um, over the past two semesters almost, of looking at those user experiences in this virtual world. Um, and we're very proud about that. And the way they've adjusted to doing these major 36 unit projects virtually, and to be able to work with everybody in this space, um, it's going to be a skill set that's going to serve them for a very long time. They're very aware of constraints, how to work with them. Um, their communication skills have also translated so well in the virtual world. Um, and, and, and it's just going to again serve them. 
they have a very global perspective. Our program is global um, and they now have classmates that are global. Um, so they're <clears throat> really learning how to integrate and, and accommodate in, in those, those ways too. And they can program, they can draw, they can design rapidly um, to, to get these prototypes to, to solve, um, to research and solve problems quickly. And that's going to be a great skill again, as, as everybody is across the globe and looking for solutions, is somebody that can just sit down and be like, hey, wait, I think I can make that and go ahead and put something together to show the rest of the team um, what they're meaning. I think it's going to be really, really helpful in the future. Next, please. So if this is something interesting to you, <clears throat> we have many different ways that you can engage with the ETC. Um, we have a fall festival coming up. Uh, we have it every year. It is going to be virtual this year, and it's very exciting. We have a team of students looking to solve that. And how is this a very physical event? It truly is a festival event in our building. Getting that translated to have that same feel and somewhat experience virtually. If that sounds interesting to you, you're welcome to reach out to me. We can add you into our guest list. Um, you can do a tech talk to our students. They love technical talks. They like to have that more advanced information. You know, maybe how you're solving a similar problem, um, some industry trends, something that, that you think they might find really um, relevant. They, they enjoy that. Portfolio reviews for designers, for artists, uh, they would welcome. <clears throat> We're always looking for um, people to review portfolios. You can post open positions. Um, we make it really simple at the ETC. I am embedded with them. Um, the size of the program is 150 to 160 students going through the program at one time. That's so each year is between 75 to 80 students. So it's not a very large program. We, again, when we're in the building, we are physically all together. We have lots of communication, lots of contact, and I can get open positions out to them very quickly. So you would work directly with me and we could get these things posted. In addition, if you have a broader reach and you want additional students at CMU, I'm happy to um, get you hooked up with Sean if, if you haven't had that chance yet. Um, and we can work together to, to, to get your positions out to whomever might be relevant. <clears throat> You can host us for a virtual, for now, site visit for students. So every January, the ETC, um, we take all of our first year students to Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, and we do physical site visits. And it helps them to build their network and to get a feel for organizations, large, small, you know, what, what are they looking for? Um, and we're gonna be doing this again this January, um, but I'm open to continuing to do it. So if you feel like you would, like to host a students for site visits. You know, maybe you've got, um, maybe you're physically back into your building, you wanna show them around and have some people chat with them, um, or you've got some video, or we just like to have a moment, um, some time to talk with students. Happy to help make that arrangement. <clears throat> you can sponsor a semester long project. Drew kind of went through the, the bits and pieces of that. Um, we are always looking for organizations that might have a problem, um, one with some, some wonderful students to kind of tackle and, and tug at that problem. Um, and again, you can follow up with us directly and, and, and chat about that if you'd like to sponsor a project. Um, as far as hiring students, we have our summer internships, we have a co-op opportunities, and um, there's full-time positions and can even get um, postings out to our alumni if you have needs for more experienced hires. And lastly, coming up soon, we are actually starting our executive education um, program. It'll be, of course, for your um, employees, something to, to offer them if they would like to get some additional skill sets um, in these types of areas. I don't have a whole lot of detail. It will be authentic to the ETC spirit. It you know, will still be about iteration. It'll be about working together, collaboration, communication, um, but at more of an executive level. So stay tuned for that. Next, please. There we are. So here's our contact information. Um, <clears throat> again, we're both very accessible. Email is a great way uh, to reach out. So we encourage you to do that. And um, Drew, please feel free to jump in on anything that I've said or else we can open up for questions. Yeah, uh, I think uh, somebody had uh, a question about the co-op. Susan, yeah. could you explain that a little bit more? 
Absolutely. We get this question a lot. So um, we're the ETC is very lucky. We are um, only there's only a few academic programs at Carnegie Mellon that allow for co-op. The way we define a co-op is either spring term or fall term. The students choose to waive one of those big projects um, and they go to work for a company full time. So we have some guidelines around it. They have to be within a team. Um, and he's been successful lately virtually. So we can, it could be virtually or physically. But be on a team, um, work that is relevant to their ETC degree and, and what they're wanting to go into. Um, <clears throat> it's paid and it needs to line up with the semester because they're doing this for academic credit. So it's about 15 weeks each semester. And the students get their grade this way. And there's three ways that they get their grade. They have um, an email um, exchange with the other students on co-op and with Drew. Drew is the faculty um, contact on this on the co-ops. Um, and they may talk about the work that they're, in, that they're doing. Um, and Drew always puts out a professional development topic. You know, talk about how meetings are handled. Um, what's public relations like in your, at your company? Um, the students and we fully support non-disclosure agreements and, and several of our students every semester end up under NDAs and they're very aware of that. So they won't disclose anything in those emails that they're not allowed to. So that's one way they get their grade. Another way is um, Drew at midterm and at finals sends out a short rubric on their performance. And so he gathers feedback from their supervisor. And then at the end of the semester, the students write a paper. So that's that's how they earn that credit. Drew, jump in. I kind of <laughs> it's kind of your Susan world. Did a great job. Like from I think from a company perspective, it feels very similar to an internship. Mm -hmm. Like you have somebody on board, and sometimes some companies strategically line it up to have it happen, say during the spring semester, right before graduation. So they actually make a full time offer. The student comes on, and for that January to May is fully enrolled for one semester, and kind of just rolls in into full time employment right out of you know, assuming everything goes well, which it often does. Um, but th those are just the academic rubric around that. And the co-ops only happen during the spring and the fall. And only their second year. Yes, only their second year. So they've got a little bit more <clears throat> aiming for that way. So we feel more comfortable vouching for them in that regard. We know them enough to be able to go, oh, they're great. Like one of the things Susan and I have sort of promised to employers and to our students is we'll let you know, you know, our, our perception on them, not in any sort of bad way, but if somebody, you know, this programmer is just a little quiet, you know, but they're amazingly talented, or this programmer thinks they're the smartest person in the room, just so you, you know, <laughs> just so you're aware of what you're getting, because we want to help our students build forward, and like our grads are our reputation in that regard. That's, that's great stuff. I, I, you know, one thing I wanted to point out, and, you know, if you've been to the ETC Center, um, it's so unique and I, you know, it's hard to describe it in, in my words, but perhaps you can give a little perspective into that so that people understand the culture of the students and what they're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that'd be, that'd be wonderful. I mean, walking in there, it's like walking into like a, a video game or something like that. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, part of that comes from that. That is true. And that was an intentional. We are off campus. Um, part of the reason we are off campus is, we take a lot of space. These semester long projects we talk about, we actually dedicate large rooms that like five to seven students sit together all semester long. They treat it like their little startup office. Um, so like it's, it was, there's so, space is so precious. There wasn't enough room on campus really. So we were able to make it work in this building. Um, and then one of like, as I mentioned, one of the founders, Don Marinelli came out of drama. So he is a firm believer in let's have our space reflect sort of like our ethos. And so as sort of Jeff said, it's like we have um, examples of work, both in terms of the industry in general, like both historic and regular, like there's statues of like the Incredible Hulk and Marvel and DC and also old school sci-fi and Star Trek and Star Wars. But there's also some of that is the reason it's out there is because of our alums are out there and they're working on those IP and those properties. Um, and so we really sort of designed the whole space um, to be this, this <laughs> Somewhat of like a, like D Don used to say, it's almost like Disneyland, but in an academic context where we should charge, 
we should charge for people coming visit, but we, you know, n during normal times, not pandemic times, we host tours regularly because it's such a fun visit. And as much as that space and part of the reason we do the space the way we do is to sort of encourage and challenge our students to go out and do the next thing. Um, uh, you know, that's what they're aiming for in their careers and their passions. Um, we're also, it helps sort of like, um, it's kind of like the honey to the trap where then you come in and we are able to like, oh, we've got student projects working on stuff, come visit them and they'll tell you all about uh, uh, what they're doing. And then you give them a little play testing, a little feedback. And so it helps them get some input from like strangers just really quickly on what they're doing and why. And it also helps them as they regularly do that, they get more and more comfortable um, communicating what they're doing and how they're doing it. And we found, we keep hearing from employers that that's just a skill set that's so durable for our grads. It's like, they, they're just very good at communicating stuff and talking to people at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Ooh, and yes, we'll share. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, thanks for sharing. Someone asked about the uh, contact information. So there you go. Um, another question I had, which I think is interesting. So when, when you have a project and you have a team, five to seven students, you said each student has a role on the team. Can you kind of, Give us an example of how that those roles are broken down for each student. Yeah, it, it, it kind of ranges from project to project. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in there, but you know, it, the big buckets are technical. Like, does the project need programming skills? So then we're looking to fill those roles to make sure that there's like a programmer on the team or an engineer of some sort. You know, an earlier question in the chat was around hardware, hardware and software. Some projects definitely need hardware support. So we make sure there's an industrial designer or a mechanical engineer, or electrical engineer on that team. Similarly with art, then we are looking like what's the, what seems to be the goals of the project. Does it need 2D art or 3D art? A lot of concept art, um, a lot of UX um, work throughout the semester. Um, like a big thing now is a lot of companies are curious about AR, VR, MR, XR, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the, those projects tend to need um, UX UI designers in there to help them really think through um, the interfaces of what they're and the experience they're trying to um, commit. And one of the fun things about engagements through these projects, one of my favorite examples, we were working with a theater company, um, the Theater of War, I don't know if anybody's heard of them, but they have sort of um, innovated this idea of using restaging live readings of old school Greek tragedies to help soldiers recover from their PTSD. And they've proven to be so, so impactful and effective, but they can only do about a hundred at a time. And then they say it doesn't work. And they came to us because they thought, well, could we help replicate this somehow in virtual reality? They thought that would be the best way to do it. And as they were working with the student team, the student, the, the client, the theater of war kept saying, well, the most important thing is not really the live reading. It's what the live reading inspires in conversations that happen afterwards. And so that led the team to pitch to the client instead of doing VR, what if we do a board game? Because in a board game, you're inherently around a table talking to each other the whole time. Whereas in VR currently, it's a little hard to have conversations. Um, and they would have never thought of that. And they just opened their eyes to, you know, and it was really exciting to see them sort of take a left turn in that regard. And so that, you know, that project needed designers. And, you know, we always have somebody who has to step into the role of what we call producer, where they're sort of managing budget expectations, scheduling expectation, client relationships. Um, and so like, we're always doing our best as faculty to kind of make sure there's a mix in there so that we're at least setting up skill set wise. And one of the things we didn't address here just because it was such a, we've actually done going on probably eight years of research on how we help support this creative collaboration. Um, and the big thing that came out of that was uh, these, these sort of like, interdisciplinary diverse teams, the better, the more diversity we have on the teams, the more innovative the work that they actually do. Like we, we've been working with Tepper doing these studies to show that if a team is more diverse, it'll actually statistically do better, more innovative work. But at the same time, more diverse teams tend to have more conflict because you have artists and programmers and designers and you know, women and men and somebody from China and somebody from you know, America. And it's like all of that diversity leads to um, the potential for collective intelligence to be greater, but because everybody comes with different agendas, you have to work through um, those differences in ways that then leverage towards positive results. And that's one of the things we really work hard on is supporting that process. So those become constructive conversations instead of destructive arguments. Yeah, well, that's, that's great experience. That's terrific. Well, I know we're over time. 
and uh, oh shoot yeah i have a 12 30. <laughs> if anybody else has another question please put it in the chat um but i want to thank everybody for one attending today and thank you very much to drew and susan for for their time and talking yeah, about the etc it's a great program uh the students coming out of there um as you can see and based on Drew and Susan's presentation. They're very unique and very high caliber and uh, great, great additions to teams that uh, have a need for, for the, the uh, curriculum that they're going through. So uh, thank you to everybody. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to, you have uh, Susan and Drew's email information. And, and as always um, here at the uh, Career Professional Development Center, feel free to reach out to, to myself uh, within the employer relations team. And uh, we do have uh, some upcoming events. We're gonna be putting our events for spring recruitment here pretty soon. So in the next week, um, you should see all the events that we will have uh, regarding career fairs uh, and other opportunities for recruiting on campus or virtually that is uh, in the upcoming semester. So to everybody who joined us today, thank you very much and, and talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a good day.